Overview of this very broad disease that affects our daily practice frequently. And um, um, I think, I think um, Wolfgang Feske has a short question to you. Hello, Wolfgang. Uh, good, good morning. Good morning. I, good morning. I just apologize to Mr. To, okay, you can hear me? Wonderful. I hear you. I'm very happy to be part of the German Vietnamese meeting again. But the question of pulmonary embolism, even without uh, very uh, impressive symptoms, is today COVID 19, 19 infections. What is your strategy in those patients who have survived COVID uh, infection? Without uh, symptoms, do you do routinely uh, pulmonary angiography or uh, what is your strategy? We see a lot of pulmonary embolism in these patients who are suffering a little bit of dysplasia months after the infection. Um, I would not go so far to say in all of the patients, but uh, I agree with you, there are some well-documented data, Essen University has uh, 250 post-COVID patients and in Bonn they published also, I, I'm sure you knew, that uh, some thousands of patients were that. Uh, in any case of persisting dyspnea at the moment, I would go and exclude pulmonary embolism, whether it's uh, it maybe echo for the right ventricle, um, if you do angiogram all the time, that should be in a study, I think, because it's contrast and X-ray. But uh, to my clinical opinion, uh, I think pulmonary embolism is so often overseen that I gave the, uh, the motto in our hospital, if somebody has dyspnea, please prove it's no pulmonary embolism. Are there any questions? So, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now I want to introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is Wolfgang Feske. He's a real expert in echocardiography, and his topic today is the cardiac output measurement by echocardiography. Simple looking, needed everywhere, a practical application challenge. This Wolfgang. Okay, we, we are sitting face to face in, uh, and we must, you, you must close your uh, loudspeaker. Okay, wonderful. I try to get my uh, screen open and this is what I want to show to you. I hope that everybody can hear me. Can can you hear me? Oh, yeah. just a minute. No, you should be able to hear me. Can you just uh, show me? Uh, Yuen, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So I, I hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. So this is my question. This is the second. Uh, Vietnamese virtual meeting. We had already one in January with the uh, Bach Mai Hospital and it worked uh, very nicely. So I'm uh, convinced that this will also uh, will work as we have done it, uh, seen it before. Cardiac output measurement by echocardiography. Why is that so important? One thing is that we are all calculating the opening area of the stenotic aortic valve by continuity equation. And with the continuity equation, we are using the subvalvular uh, stroke volume uh, as a reference for the uh, transvalvular velocity. This is one point. The other point is that this is uh, the newest guidelines of the ACCAHA on uh, mitral regurgitation, and you all know the discussion when we are talking about, uh, about uh, mitra FR, uh, FR or co-op study uh, about um, mitra clip or interventional treatment of mitral regurgitation, and we have to uh, objectivate that what we see in the severity of a disease. 
And what we see there in the guidelines, at least the American guidelines, now are regurgitant volumes, uh, which have to be quantified. And we always are talking about the regurgitation fraction. And this has a lot to do with uh, stroke volume measurements. And next is uh, that we have to think about stress echocardiography, specifically for uh, uh, all kinds of valvular heart disease, but also for uh, myocardial diseases, we should look for reaction, physiological uh, reaction on stress, on heart failure, and uh, specifically on the perioperative uh, status of the patient, the uh, ICU, we have to know something about the uh, uh, cardiac output and shunt calculation. Here you see typically a sinus venosus defect and we have to calculate the uh, shunt by comparing the flow across the aortic uh, versus the flow across the pulmonary valve. So reasons enough to talk about uh, that what we can do with echo for stroke volume and cardiac output measurements. And uh, just to summarize at the beginning, the methods that we are using, we can uh, use 2D or 3D flow area measurements, mostly for the left ventricular outflow tract, perhaps in some cases for shunt, uh, for instance, the right ventricular outflow tract. And there are descriptions of the mitral valve, which I completely in your because I, th I think it is not really uh, serious to do that. And we are calculating this flow area by multiplying uh, this flow area afterwards with the velocity time integral across this flow area. And the second method to do volume uh, measurements is that we do it with volumina, uh, uh, volumina of the left ventricle, perhaps in some cases the right ventricle, but also as I told it for the area of the mitral valve inflow region, I do not really believe that this can be used for routine work. So uh, we have always to ask in all what we do, if it is plausible what we do, and we need to know the standard conditions where these measurements can be done in a serious way. So let's talk again about this uh, continu continuity equation. You are calculating, everybody knows this, the stroke volume is uh, the area times the velocity time integral. What is the area? The area is half of the diameter uh, squared times uh, P and uh, velocity time integral, all these two parameters have to be discussed and uh, analyzed if they can be used in this specific patient. One thing which is really important is the left ventricular outflow determination. If you are aware of the situation that half of the diameter will be squared for the calculation of the area, you can imagine that these measurements that we are doing normally in our routine work for 1.9 and 2 2.2 centimeters in this specific patient will give incredible high differences in the uh, area calculated. That means that in this specific patient, you can have a severe or a moderate severe aortic valve stenosis. This is a true problem. And there are a lot of uh, papers out and just recently, we saw a comparison of cardiac output with two-dimensional, three-dimensional transesophageal echocardiography compared to transpulmonary uh, terminal illusion techniques. And they found out very uh, systematically analyzed in transesophageal echocardiography during uh, cardiac operations that if you are measuring the left ventricular outflow tract uh, just some millimeters below the uh, annulus, or you are uh, measuring without aortic stenosis the opening area, and you combine that to either CW Doppler or uh, uh, different kinds of analysis of 
the uh, pulse Doppler echo, you can get reasonable results. And which is really interesting is that that what we routinely do is that we are taking this subvalvular uh, annulus and we are taking the uh, surrounding spectrum velocity, you will get the best results. This is one uh, publication which uh, comes out, but this uh, really gives us some reasoning to continue our work at this field. The next, what we have to think of is in our specific individual patients always what is the size of the area? We are taking only one diameter, but everybody knows from uh, TAVI uh, uh, implantation of uh, aortic valve prosthesis that the shape of the uh, left ventricular outward tract, the annulus, might be ellipsoid and it, uh, oval shaped. And this is not always circular round. And this is a true problem. And you can see if you take the original, uh, the true area by, uh, in this case, by transophageal echocardiography, or you take only the short diameter, this gives incredible high differences in the calculation of the subvalvular uh, stroke volume. And this will also has a, extreme consequence on how many patients, for instance, you will find with normal flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. If you take the overshaped orifice area, then you will have 61% of those patients who have been uh, defined before only by taking the shorter diameter as normal flow, low gradient uh, aortic stenosis who have definitely a moderate severe aortic stenosis. You must keep that in mind. I do not want to stress that you always have to take the uh, complete area of the subvalvular uh, annular size, but it should be mentioned that patients are different from uh, her, uh, their individual echocardiographic conditions. One other thing which has been to uh, discuss, uh, discuss is the velocity profile. We are always thinking that when we are measuring the profile in the left ventricular outflow tract or in the right ventricular outflow tract, that this is a flat profile, which is not at all true. We have, uh, during the pulsatile flow, we have acceleration zones and the profile changes over time. And uh, you can see it, how the uh, profile changes. These are uh, uh, technical uh, analysis, which you can directly pick out from the internet. And you see that in the acceleration phase, this flattens the profile with time. And uh, the same is through for the deceleration phase afterwards. So it is not at all, even if in a, in a rectangular tube here, it is not always uh, the case that you only find a flat profile. And the most difficult situation is that what we see in our patients, that we have curved, bended tubes in the left ventricular outflow tract, for instance. And there you must look for the directly to be analyzed uh, velocity profile. And there have been some ideas out that you can measure the velocity profile across the uh, subvalvular area, which is seen here in a model. And uh, I will show you uh, to you how it works normally in our routine work. You see here a patient with a bicuspid uh, valve, uh, severely symptomatic. And I go over to the next. And what we do, and what you should do in all these patients, you should take, uh, if you have a 3D transduce, it's wonderful. Otherwise, you should uh, take both planes in the uh, five chamber view and the long axis. This is the, uh, the other side because it is a 3D uh, transducer. You should look for the velocity profile uh, under the valve where you are measuring 
the velocities afterwards. And this can be uh, perfectly done if you take it in 3D echocardiography and this shows that this is first of all an oval shaped uh, cross area and you can uh, surely see that it is not at all homogeneous flat profile. But we accept this compromise and we are taking the velocity and now it is the question where do we take the velocity and here you can see that we are approaching sorry we are oh sorry I, I will have it we are approaching the valve step by step and everybody says you should be just below the valve itself but this is critical with pulse doppler what we normally prefer is that we take the shadow in this CW Doppler and we are taking the velocity from this shadow and the velocity in the valve by uh, the CW Doppler is the highest velocity and we have the DVI, the uh, uh, quotient between the two velocities as an indicator for severity. In this specific case, we have a very uh, broad diameter uh, below the valve with 2.5 centimeters that results in uh, 0.9 centimeters square, which is just at the limit of to be a severe stenosis. And uh, what we, and this is my personal opinion, prefer to do in all these patients, if there is uh, little uncertainty about the severity, we take it with the 3D echocardiography or with X-plane and we planim planimetry the valve and this is the easiest and the best way of uh, sizing the orifice area. So we need to calculate the subvalvular stroke volume for the continuity quotient and here you see a patient who has been operating in our department he has got an Inspirus uh, 23 millimeter valve that you, and he has got a moral resection of the subvalvular area. And what happened to uh, happened still to that patient is he has a severe, though he has been resected here, severe subvalvular velocity increase acceleration, which gives very high velocities already here in this area. And this is a typical case of all those patients who we are uh, uh, treating with aortic stenosis and uh, typically the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with small ventricles and uh, subvalvular narrowing. And it is very difficult to get out a uh, velocity profile uh, in the subvalvular area. There are the high velocities. And if you are looking for this uh, 3D cut, through the valve, you can uh, see here, uh, even if it is a typical patient and not an ideal image, that there are extremely differences in the velocities across the cross section. So we do not really rely on these values. And what we do normally, we are scanning with our CW through the valve, and you see that there is the acceleration in the lower part or the more apical part of the left ventricle. And here is the valve itself. And then it is difficult to find out what is the valve. We try to fix the valve itself, but we all know that the subvalvular velocity in this case through the valve, we have only 3.1 millimeter um, uh, meter per second and below the valve, we have 1.3 uh, meters. That is normal relation for a prosthesis, but it is difficult to understand and to explain to the people that with a fresh operated uh, uh, prosthesis, you have high, such high velocities. What you can also do if you want to have the true uh, stroke volume in these patients, and this is my topic of the talk, uh, you have the pulmonary valve, which in some patients can be perfectly investigated from the subcoastal view. And the problem there is to uh, measure the diameter. In this case, it is 2.1 centimeters guessed. And then you can calculate the uh, aortic valve area by the same method as we did it before the subvalvular area. So we are quite happy that this specific patient 
the uh, 23 millimeter prosthesis has uh, an opening area of 1.8 centimeters square. It is difficult and must be decided in patient individually if you can accept uh, the method of uh, calculating the stroke volume in the left ventricular outflow tract or in the right ventricular outflow tract. So the second topic uh, for the measurement of the uh, uh, stroke volume is to do it by 2D echo or by 3D echo. This is uh, a very early paper of Harald Becher and his group at that time in Canada already, and they told us that 2D echo is good and 3D echo is good with acceptable uh, image quality uh, for calculation of ejection fraction, but it is not at all good for volumes. This was true before the uh, famous recommendations for quanti uh, ch uh, cardiac chamber quantification came out by Roberto Lang, and this is the best uh, uh, summary of all publications which came out. And you all know that they explained us that we should take biplane measurements for measuring ejection fraction. You can add contrast, and this is a company interest or industry interest that contrast is not accepted worldwide uh, everywhere. And uh, they say this is, uh, as correlated to MRI images, the better method, or you can even take 3D echocardiography. We are using these methods, perhaps we are using, most of us are using the uh, method of DISCs for 2D imaging, biplane 2D imaging for measuring ejection fraction, but nobody should really uh, dare to say that this has been uh, reasoned by the uh, recommendation that you can calculate stroke volumes from these measurements. But nevertheless, this is the method where today the, those who are really uh, very ambitious in measuring a true quantification of uh, uh, quantitative mitral regurgitation are measuring the stroke volume. This is Andreas Hagendorf from Germany who has uh, defended this true quantitative aspect uh, and he has uh, just written a paper. He, I was co-author, but I retired myself from this co-authorship because I personally do not believe that. I do not want to explain to you everything, but they compare the stroke volume by 2D or biplane uh, to the echocardiography to the left ventricular outflow tract, and then they uh, create the difference between both and uh, say that this is this uh, uh, regurgitation volume, or from that they can also calculate regurgitation fraction. I really do not believe that this is what we can do, and I am in uh, agreement with Paul Graben, which I know very well. I've been several weeks together with him in former times, and he underlines that transthoracic echocardiography and TEE are excellent for uh, diagnosing mitral regurgitation and to have an idea if it is severe or it is not severe. But the true quantification multi-detector is for uh, intuitive valves or other uh, 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 um, valves which can be implanted by transcathetic techniques but what he says is that cardiac magnetic resonance should be the uh, reference method. I do not believe this because we have too bad experience and too little experience in our uh, daily work with magnetic resonance imaging for measuring the stroke volume. This might be possible as for aortic regurgitation, but it is uh, depending on the flow measurements and not on volume measurements just by uh, planimetry, the images we see. So we all know that uh, PISA method has uh, drawbacks uh, in many, many, many 
things. One is the geometrical aspect, uh, as you can see here in typical case where you have an eccentric, you have a P2 flail and you have an eccentric inflow and outflow through the valve and you cannot really use the PISA method. And by the way, I never take the zero shift because that what you see here is a representative of what you do with uh, zero shift. You are not linearly increasing only the size of the Nyquist limit. You are also uh, changing the amount of backflowing blood. So this is not really serious to take uh, the uh, PISA method for quantification regurgitated flow. What we can see here is a typical example of a pseudo prolapse, a pseudo balo with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And you see end systolic, there is a severe regurgitation, but how do you want to quantify that? This is very difficult to quantify what is the argumentation for taking PISA or Vena contractor or uh, regurgitation flow via these methods if it is not continuously uh, regurgitant over the uh, whole cycle. What we prefer in these cases, cases is that we take the uh, orifice area itself and we do planimetry of the vena contractor and we, in this specific cases, we have to add this vena contractor and we believe at the end that we have a uh, semi-quantitative aspect that this is a severe regurgitation. What the guidelines of the American Society of Cardiography propose is extremely difficult to do and nobody really uses it, that you compare the left ventricular outflow tract uh, stroke volume to that what flows across the mitral valve. This is, in my eyes, not serious and one should really test in normal patient, the stroke volume across the mitral valve to the left ventricular outflow tract, and you need a confidence interval which you have to uh, define before. What we find and which is really assuring us that uh, in these patients, we have done the right uh, decision to operate that patient and to reconstruct the valve is that you see that the ejection fraction in this patient goes extremely down, but the ejection fraction is only one part of the uh, story. The rest is that the stroke volume across the my, uh, aortic valve stays constant. So you are losing the backward uh, flow across the mitral valve and the cardiac output remains the same. So at the end, uh, I want to remind again that it is possible in my eyes, if you respect the specific conditions for left ventricular outflow tract uh, measurement. You can measure the cardiac output there and you can even take a right ventricular outflow tract. Mitral valve is not serious if you want to calculate by velocity time interval and left ventricular volume by 2D or 3D echocardiography remains very, very difficult to do. It depends on the configuration of the ventricle and we routinely will not accept that as a quantitative, uh, quantitative aspect to calculate mitral regurgitation. So I thank you for your attention. Okay, jetzt kannst du deinen anmachen. Ah, sorry. Uh, sorry, I have to... Very interesting presentation. Is there any question from the audience? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, for the next talk, I would like to invite Dr. Fleischmann. So you are talking about yeah. STEMI and acute coronary syndrome. Challenging yeah. cases from the tele. Yeah, good morning, dear colleagues. I'm very happy to join this uh, German Vietnamese uh, symposium, which is the first for me to do an online presentation. So I hope everything will work correctly in the technical mode. And I will share my screen with you now. So uh, what is that? Ah, here, okay.
So now we have the PowerPoint presentation. Can you see the presentation? Okay, I hear you. Can you see? Okay, so yeah, I will start. My topic is to talk about acute coronary syndrome and especially STEMI patients and, and the treatment in the cath lab. And I have four cases, uh, I have chosen four cases for you uh, to discuss some aspects of this topic. So the first case is uh, from the medical point, not very complicated. Uh, is a man, 56 years old. He's working in Wolfsburg in the Volkswagen factory. This is a very big factory, about 30,000 workers there, and they have their own medical system and emergency system and everything. And this man, he went to work at six o'clock in the morning, and soon after he started working, he experienced severe chest pain. So he went to the emergency department, which is in the uh, factory area, and they have uh, their own ambulance, which arrived uh, quickly, and they did an ECG. As you can see the times, it took about 15 minutes from uh, when he arrived at the emergency department to the ECG. And here you can see the ECG, which shows you a large inferior myocardial infarction with, with a huge ST segment elevation in two, three VF, and even in the lateral planes. So we can say we have a very big uh, inferior infarction in this case. And uh, the patient was uh, put into the ambulance car and brought to the cath lab. And that, what, that is what we found. We find the right coronary artery Proximally occluded is quite a big artery, as you can see. And the left coronary artery has no severe atherosclerotic disease, but there are no collaterals from left to right. So it's crucial for the myocardial salvage of the patient to get the right coronary artery open quickly. And that's what we did. We have a wire through here, and now we see. You can see the white material in here. So there's an atherosclerotic lesion and some large thrombus here. So we decided to do thrombus aspiration, which we do not routinely. And we, can, we got out some red thrombus in this patient. And uh, I would like to discuss this aspect of the case because the routine use of thrombus aspiration is not recommended in our guidelines. But the guidelines stay, state, and you must know, that in certain cases with a large thrombus burden, as mentioned here in the text, there's even a difference in cardiovascular death if you, can, if you are able to remove the thrombus. So you should uh, choose uh, individually whether you do that or not. And this is what the guideline says in case of large thrombus burden, uh, thermos aspiration may be considered. And so we did it in this case and we could have had a good result after stent implantation. There's some residual thrombus here. We did not do any further dilatation because we were fearing uh, that we could compromise the flow to these right ventricular branches, which are open but occluded uh, approximately. Uh, so we uh, stopped the procedure here and we had uh, level cardiography, we had uh, large inferior hypokinesia, uh, which, as we know from echocardiography, some days later uh, resolved, uh, not completely, but the LV function uh, got better in the, in the following days. We had high CK in the initial uh, examination as marker of myocardial damage, but the CK uh, got down very quickly, and so the left ventricular function uh, could be uh, not preserved, but uh, yeah, ameliorated. So I want to draw the attention of your, of your, want to draw your attention to the uh, organization of this case. He had begin of symptoms ten minutes before uh, seven, and he had the artery open in ten minutes after. Eight. So this is one hour and 20 minutes. And this can only be achieved if you have a good attention, not only to the Catholic procedure itself, but also to the logistics around. So you have to know 
uh, you must recognize the symptoms as early as possible, which was uh, good in this case because this man went to train personnel in the emergency department of the Volkswagen factory. And they did right. They read, registered the ECG immediately, which is very important to, to get the diagnosis. And after that, they started to call the hospital and tell us, we have a patient here, we'll come to you to, to be uh, treated. And this is very important because this means that the hospital can prepare for the case. The cath lab team can be activated and the interventional doctor can come in if it's outside working hours and uh, all is ready when the patient comes. And when the patient comes, he's not going to the emergency department. And unless he is not hemodynamically unstable, he's also not going to the emergency department, but directly to the cath lab. And these logistic points are very crucial uh, to have a good medical result, logistic optimization, additionally to optimization of the procedure in the cath lab. And this is a very important message I want to uh, give to you. And this is why I showed you this case. My next case is a 96-year-old man. He had uh, chest pain in the early morning and nearly in the night. And he went, he did not call the ambulance, but he went to his family doctor. So this means he lost a lot of time, so maybe three or four hours. And the first ECG the family doctor recorded was about 11 o'clock in the morning and showed right bundle branch block and tachycardia and also a C segment elevation. I will show you the ECG uh, soon. And uh, this is why the family doctor called the ambulance and the patient was brought to the hospital and he arrived uh, short before noon. He had chest pain since uh, some days, but not so severe uh, before. Only the day of admission was very severe and he had risk profile, but no uh, significant cardiovascular disease before. And this is the ECG. So the ECG is the, shows tachycardia. We have a complete right bundle branch block and we have very... Uh, extensive ST segment elevation here in the inferior leads and also in the lateral leads. So we might suspect we could have a lateral myocardial infarction in this case, but uh, maybe it's a, a big uh, infarction because of the extent of the ST segment elevation. And we, don't, we are not sure uh, whether we have some anterior problem also because we don't know whether the right bundle branch block is new or was known before. We don't know this. So we brought this patient to the cath lab and still when he arrived, he's not really good hemodynamically. The uh, tachycardia is uh, less now, 80 only, not 115 as before, but the blood pressure is low and uh, we, uh, start the coronary angiography, uh, looking for the right coronary artery, which you can see here is a normal sized artery, no severe other sclerotic disease. And uh, we can not really see collaterals to the left side. So um, we are not sure what we have to expect when we go to the left. And here we can see the first shot to the left coronary artery. And as we suspected, we find occlusion of the circumflex artery. We must uh, keep in mind that at that moment, maybe it was five or six hours from the onset of symptoms that this artery is occluded. And we see another problem. We have high proximal LED stenosis here. And uh, LED pro perfusion is timely. It's a timid three flow, but uh, this is a very severe stenosis. So what should we do with this situation? We have an occluded artery, but uh, already probably uh, a damage in this area and another artery, which is clearly prognostically relevant and really dangerous. So what sh shall we do now? We started to put wire in, and this was uh, by chance that the wire run into the LAD and here in the diagonal branch, but we were happy about this because it gave us more safety for this lesion. And we still have TIMI3 flow in the LED area. So this is uh, uh, reassuring. So we have a good start. 
uh, with a bit, little bit luck, but uh, we did want to wire both uh, arteries uh, intentionally. So it was not very difficult to get through the circumflex occlusion. We have a high-grade lesion now, but we have flow, not TIMI3, but TIMI2. We can see the, the course of the artery. We can see the short stenosis, not much thrombus, so no thrombus aspiration required. And uh, as such lesions frequently consist of soft plug, we decided to go for direct stent implantation. And here we place the stent and we open the stent and uh, we have a quite good result. So what should, should we do now? Should we go for this additional uh, stenosis in the circumflex territory here, posterior lateral, the other posterior lateral, or here? Or should we go to, for this lesion or should we leave it and uh, do it in another procedure? It's really difficult uh, to decide now how to continue. And uh, we uh, discussed in, in our group what to do. Uh, and we decided not to go for all these bifurcations here uh, regarding that the symptoms were uh, for many hours already and we had TIMI 3 flow in all arteries and would have taken a lot of contrast and everything to, to get this fine. And so we decided, decided we had finished the circumflex territory for now and we decided to go on for the LED territory. And also here we decided to go for direct stenting and we placed the stent and as you see, we had not much time to uh, pu put the stent. Uh, we had to be very quick because we have no flow now and we had to adjust uh, to not uh, compromise the left main bifurcation and we quickly opened the stent. And uh, after that, we had nice flow in the LED territory and uh, we checked in different projections whether everything was fine, no dissection in the LAD and the left main bifurcation uh, free of uh, compromise. And we were, were very content in the end of this procedure. So the left ventricle in the patient uh, is compromised in the circumflex territory, as you can see here. And also, if you look at the lateral view, is here the circumflex territory is compromised, but the LAD territory is maybe slightly hypokinetic, but not much, especially septally contraction is rather normal. So this patient had initial CK, even take blood taken before start of the angi angiography, very high. So the uh, myocardial infarction already was ongoing for some hours. This meant that the kinesia in the inferior and lateral uh, uh, part of the heart did not resolve. We, ha we had a, a scar there some days later, but the global function uh, improved slightly and we, we were content. So we have to discuss, should we have done the LED procedure in the same uh, session or should we have uh, done this separately? And we have our guidelines of uh, 2017 for the myocardial infarction treatment. And they say non-infarct related artery PCI should be considered, should be also, we should do in patients with cardiogenic shock. This was not a very frank cardiogenic shock, but the patient was not well doing hemodynamically. And the prognostic relevance of the LED lesion is quite clear. So we decided to do that. Uh, as recommended in these guidelines. But one year later, we have new guidelines on myocardial infarction. And in the meantime, the culprit shock study had been published. And they, in this study, it was, has been shown that uh, immediate doing of non infarct related artery uh, leads to a higher 30-day mortality than if you defer it. So, and it leads to more frequent uh, renal function uh, deterioration. So in the next guideline, only one year later, they say it's not recommended to do that. So it's a really difficult uh, uh, decision. Uh, if you have the acute case, what will you do? Will you stop and go for a second procedure some days later, or will you do it? And my personal uh, view of this is in the, actual case we did right 
because we could do that. We had the wire in and we could expect to have it done with little contrast, uh, additional contrast media need, and with little risk of uh, compromise in the LED territory. If we had risk to damage the LED or if we had a bifurcation or if we had large thrombus or much arteriosclerosis, much calcification, if it would have been a very complicated procedure, maybe we would have better decided not to do it in the same procedure, but later for safety reason for the patient. So this is an aspect uh, we can discuss later what would our colleagues have done in a case like this. I move on to the next case. We have a 76 year old man who has chest pain on low level ex exertion since one or two weeks. And uh, when he comes to the hospital, he has atrial fibrillation, but not hemodynamically critical is the normal heart rate. And he has his T segment uh, depression anteriorly, not uh, no ST segment elevation, so it's not STEMI. We have a little bit of time, so we made echocardiography, we found normal uh, function and no valvular disease, which was important also because we had uh, at auscultation found a systolic murmur. But as he had this ST segment depression and tr uh, elevated troponin and known coronary disease and vascular risprophy and peripheral arterial disease, we decided to do the procedure uh, on the same day, one or two hours after hospital admission. And this is what we found. We found normal left ventricular function. We have a lot of calcification in the mitral annulus. We have also calcification in the aortic root and proximal left coronary artery and nearly all the way down the right coronary artery. So we uh, expect to find uh, rather severe coronary disease. And uh, we start with the right coronary artery. And surprisingly, we found fine calcification, but no high-grade stenosis. So we do the left coronary artery. And now we can go home. We have no stenosis. Do you agree? Yeah, little surprise. We have to do more projections. It's always crucial to get uh, uh, projections to have every bifurcation and every uh, part of the artery really free side on. And uh, the next projection shows the problem. We have high grade proximal osteal circumflex lesion. And uh, if you go on to analyze this, we see we have uh, atherosclerosis in the left main and also in the proximal LID, but not high grade. And this uh, osteal circumflex stenosis. So if you go on now for the treatment of this, we have to be aware that it can uh, come to a uh, left main bifurcation intervention with maybe two wires and two stands and kissing and everything. So we prepare for that. Uh, this means we use a bigger guiding catheter. In this case, we use seven French normally uh, and we wire uh, both vessels, of course, and uh, but we decided, as you can see, it's quite a rectangular origin of the circumflex here, that we would try to do this in a one stand procedure in a T stand, T -stand uh, technique. So this is what we did. We have the wire in, which was surprisingly easy for the circumflex, but it, well, it looked difficult to get in here, but it was not really difficult. So we have its two wires now. And then we predilate uh, the circumflex osteal lesion, and we have a uh, little less stenosis and no damage to left main and uh, LAD, which is very important. So we can continue with our strategy of one stent T stenting. And uh, what we decided to do here is to put uh, a, a balloon in the left main to LAD and the stent here. Uh, in order to preserve the bifurcation and not to damage the bifurcation and not to cause a plaque shift in the direction of LED during the inflation. And you can see we place it uh, quite, we can place it in both planes quite exactly. And then we do a kissing infla inflation of both the stent and the balloon. 
And uh, after that, we have a good uh, result uh, and no damage to LED and to uh, left main. And we check this in different projections and we are quite happy with the result. We can stop the procedure here and we were lucky that we don't have to do a complex uh, left main bifurcation intervention in this case. My last case is a 60 year old man coming to the hospital uh, in the morning. He had a severe chest pain on that day, but he had chest pain since a long time already. Uh, he's a former smoker, but long ago, and he has a peripheral arterial disease and he's obese, he's rather young. So we, he comes to the hospital at uh, early, not early, 8.30 in the morning. And uh, he, he has uh, he called the ambulance to come here. And this is the ambulance ECG which uh, was sent to our hospital. And what we can see is a uh, deep ST segment depression in nearly all extremity leads and ST segment elevation in VR. So this is not 12 lead, but when we, he was in the hospital, we have 12 lead and a little bit better now, not so deep ST segment depression, but the same picture we have isolated ST segment elevation in VR and ST segment uh, depression uh, predominantly in the lateral uh, area. So what does it mean? Is it STEMI? It's not STEMI, of course, because definition requires two adjacent leads with this T-segment elevation, but for only one lead. But we have to keep in mind that uh, is T-segment elevation in lead we are can be very critical, can be signaling that we have ischemia in nearly all of the of the left ventricle, which is uh, frequently associated with left main disease. So if we have isolated ST segment elevation in VR and ST segment elevation nearly everywhere else, we should be very alarmed. And this is what uh, gave us the uh, decision to go to the cath lab rapidly. And uh, also this patient was not very fine hemodynamically, also clinically, he was sweating, he had vegetative symptoms, he was not fine. And, and China also, so we started to do the diagnostics and we found uh, a, a stenosis in the right coronary artery, but we have to look closely. What we see is a lot of collaterals to the left system and you see the calcification in near the ostium of the left and then the other plane uh, they can confirm this with the right coronary artery high-grade stenosis, and we see collaterals, and we see a lot of calcification at the left main osteal area. So we do the injection of the left coronary artery, and uh, we are prepared to find some serious thing, and uh, we are uh, uh, surprised uh, it's more serious even as we thought we have a subtotal lesion in the left main. And yeah, during this in injection, it took only maybe 20 seconds to have the catheter here and do the in injection. The patient went rapidly worse. The blood pressure got down and he was uh, threatening, threatening to go into cardiogenic shock. And as you see, I can remove the diagnostic catheter immediately. Uh, and after some catecholamine bolus, he the, the situation uh, uh, stabilized. So what can we do? Should we do this with coronary intervention? We have a right coronary artery with a high-grade stenosis. We have the problem if you go in here with a, any kind of catheter, the patient will get unstable hemodynamically. And we have probably thrombus or atherosclerotic debris in a large amount here. Then we have the circumflex ostium, we cannot even see where to wire the circumflex ostium. It's a long stenosis, proximal circumflex, and we have another stenosis here. So in this case, we decided not to dare this, uh, to treat this interventionally. We did a uh, left ventricle, which is surprisingly normal after, after the coronary angiography, we got laboratory results, the CK was also normal at that time. And so we decided to transfer this patient to a surgical center. We don't have 
cardiac surgery in our hospital. So we have to move the patient to another city, even 30 kilometers. So we called them and we organized the transport and he went to the adjacent hospital in Braunschweig where we, he was operated in the afternoon and he could receive complete arterial revascularization, which is really good with Lima artery and radial artery. And uh, so he's a young man and he has complete arterial revascularization and the operation was uneventful and he left hospital without uh, major damage at his heart and in good health. So this comes back to the first uh, patient I mentioned to you. You have not only to do good interventions, you also have to have a good organization. In this case, we had to have the good contact to the Braunschweig Hospital and to talk to our colleagues to help us with the patient. So they took him and they treated him and we were very happy that we got a good result for the patient. And uh, the guidelines stay state that cabbage should be considered in patients with ongoing ischemia, large area of jeopardized myocardium, if PCI cannot be performed. Whether it would not have been possible, I don't know, but it would have been very dangerous in this case, and I'm content that we decided for operation. Thank you for your attention, and uh, maybe well, thank you. we can discuss the case. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fleischmann. That was very spectacular cases uh, in the cath lab. So, uh, Professor Zinning, is he online? Professor Zinning, is he online? No. Okay, we have no uh, questions now, and uh, um, in the um, for time reasons, I want to uh, introduce the next speaker. This is Dr. Bill Gericke, and she's speaking about pharmacological heart failure therapy. An update in 2021. So, dear Birgit, how are you? Microphone yeah, please turn on your microphone. Okay, I'm not in the oh, meeting. It tells oh, me. Open your microphone. Okay, okay. Yeah, you know. But do you see my? I saw you, but not your slide. So where are my slides? Virtual um, slide. Okay. Yes. Doch, der Bildschirm von ihr wird freigegeben. Ja. Neue Freigabe. Das top. Ich muss hier sehen. Can the technician help me? No, here. Who is that? Yeah. Okay, okay, we see it's slide. Okay, yeah. you see it? Yeah, it's okay, good. Good. Oh, yeah, yes, it's good. Okay. Okay, then I will start. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, but I would be more happy if I would be in uh, Vietnam this time. Um, dear chairman, dear colleagues and friends in Vietnam and in Germany, I have to speak about heart failure medication. And I think this is um, a hard work to do for we have not now the new guidelines that will come in uh, autumn, I think. Uh, so I will uh, tell you some things that are very important for daily uh, practical life. Um, you see that we have a new classification for heart failure. It was published this year and it is from the Heart Failure Association of America and the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology and the Japanese and the Canadian and the India and the Australia and New Zealand and Chinese. And I think it's very um, good to know this. For you need symptoms and sign of heart failure but dyspnea may also be a sign of another disease. So you have also have
Ja. Ist, ist sie disconnected, Birgit? Ich guck mal, Birgit. Ja. Sick. Sick. Ja. Gut, dann. Okay. Okay. Ähm. Ist äh, Florian Krötz hier? Okay. So, so I think we have to wait one minute because Professor Dr. Volker Klaus is unfortunately not participate our symposium today. Birgit? So when we skip, Birgit, so when we skip Birgit, we can have uh, Professor, Professor Florian Krutz. And after Professor Florian Krutz, this is Professor Bernd Lemke. So I, I think we we'll wait one or two minutes from Birgit because he, she has just started her presentation. And when there will still uh, be some technical problems, we can go to the uh, presentation of Professor Dr. Bernd Lemke. Moin. Yeah, that's up here. We wait for one minute. Oh, the yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Bernd, hast du deinen Vortrag parat? Ja, ich habe meinen Vortrag parat. Ich könnte starten. Okay. Okay, unfortunately, uh, Birgit Gerrick is not online, actually. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Dr. Bernd Lenker, Director of the Department of Cardiology and Angiology in Klinikum Lüdenscheid. And his presentation is about pacemaker therapy, alternative pacing sites. Yeah, good evening, everybody. It is uh, my pleasure to be with you um, in this um, virtual session um, of the Vietnamese German Cardiology Symposium. And I also hope that uh, soon we can meet us personally. Um, my uh, topic is the alternative pacing sites and why we need Kannst alternative... Kannst du den zweiten Bildschirm wegmachen? Kannst du den... Du hast zwei ja. Bildschirme drauf. Diesen Bildschirmmodus oh. hast du drauf. Wir sehen zwei Bildschirme. Oh. Und, wo, und wie mache ich das weg? Ähm, <lacht> Präsentation. Bildschirmpräsentation verwenden oder sowas. Oben. Kannst du mal gucken? Oben, oben links. Ja, ja. Bildschirmpräsentation ja. verwenden ja. oder so. Bildschirmpräsentation also, beenden. Nee, nee, nee. Verwenden. Nee, nee, Bildschirm. Nee. Ach. Und jetzt unten. Jetzt da unten die. Da, da, das. Jetzt das drücken. Und dann. Ah, da kommt. Da Bildschirmpräsentation verwenden. Mach das mal. Verwenden. So, ja. jetzt. Ja. Thank you. Okay. So right ventricular apical pacing has been well established for more than 60 years. Modern cardiac pacemakers guarantee stable electrical stimulation for years and reliably uh, prevent other stalls. In the case of total free block, dual chamber pacemakers also restore synchrony between atrium and ventricle, as shown in the slide below with atrial sensed and atrial paced. Nevertheless, right ventricular apical stimulation do not, does not restore the physiological excitation of the heart, but turns it upside down. It is comparable to ventricular arrhythmias from the apex and the left bundle branch block. 
While some of the patients survive this non-physiological stimulation for years without damage, other patients um, deliver pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy. These observations are the starting point for the search of alternative stimulation sites. Kursheet retrospective studied 1,750 consecutive patients undergoing pacemaker implantation between 2003 and 2012. Patients were included if baseline uh, LVEF was normal, single chamber pace, uh, ventricular or dual chamber pacemaker was implanted and frequent more than 20% um, RV pacing was present. Uh, the pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy was defined as a more than 10% decrease in the ejection fraction, resulting in the ejection fraction of less than 50%. Of 257 patients, 20% developed pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy with a decrease of the ejection fraction from 62% to uh, 36% at a follow-up time of 3.3 years. The Danish national uh, wide registries included all patients without a known history of heart failure who had a pacemaker implanted with um, an uh, right ventricular electrode between 2000 and 2014. And that was uh, 27,000 patients. An age and gender matched control cohort of 138,000 patients with outpaced baker and heart failure was identified to compare the risk. Outcome was a cumulative incidence of heart failure and all cause mortality. And you see that uh, in the uh, uh, pacemaker uh, group, there is a higher incidence of heart failure uh, than in the control match group. Therefore, the search of alternative stimulation sites is, an all, is as old as pacemaker therapy. The figure of Arnold illustrates the current landscape of terminology and anatomy of conduction system pacing. Let's start with the most established type of an alternative stimulation, the biventricular CRT. That's here. Um, and we do this together with the right ventricular septal stimulation. In the first randomized control trial with CRT and endocardial stimulation, we placed the LV electrode in a posterior septal position and the high ventricular electrode in a mid septal position. The reason was to achieve the longest possible interventricular delay and thus an optimal resynchronization. Before large endpoint studies, um, we were able to demonstrate a benefit in clinical parameters. In a more recent electrophysiological study we done, we have shown that the interventricular conduction delay is longer um, it's longer with a septal position of the EV electrode. So that seems the best position for, um, uh, for biventricular resynchronization therapy to have one electrode in the postural lateral position and the right ventricular electrode in a mid septal position. Irgendjemand hat sein Mikro an. Everybody, some somebody has opened his microphone. Uh, left ventricular bundle branch block leads to a mechanical dyssynchrony with shortening filling uh, time, increased mitral regurgitation, reduced ejection fraction, and neurohumeral activation. With CRT, we can treat the left bundle branch block induced cardiomyopathy. As you see here, the synchronous contraction is achieved immediately with the biventricular stimulation. The prognostic effect of CRT could be demonstrated in a number of CRTs which more than, with more than 10,000 patients. The studies showed 
an improvement in functional capacity, symptoms, and LV function, but also a, re a reduction in um, heart failure hospitalization and all-cause mortality. The long-term follow-up of the MEDIT CRT trial shows a highly significant effect on mortality in patients with left bundle branch block with a risk reduction of uh, 41%. On the other side, patients without left bundle branch block showed under CRT an increase of mortality in 57%. Derived from these studies, the guidelines give, give us a recommendation with strong evidence. This includes patients with left bundle branch morphology and a class one indication if the QAS complex um, is more than 150 milliseconds. There's only an un and um, uh, 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 2A um, indication when the QAS morphology is be below 150, between 100 and it must be uh, 130 to 150 milliseconds. Um, with, on the other hand, patient with a QAS width of more than uh, of um, of uh, 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 a patient with a non left bundle branch morphology, there's um, only um, with exception of the patient with a QAF risk of more than 150 milliseconds, there's only an unclear evidence for the other indications. This applies to patient with also for patients with permanent atrial fibrillation and to patients with a pacemaker implantation. Fifty percent of the electrophysiologists prefer a septal position of the AR uh, 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 electrodes. The results are conflicting with a slightly tendency in favor of septal stimulation. Here we have a typical example of a mid-septal placed electrode in PR and LAO angulation. With the mid-septal stimulation, we do not achieve a normalization of the QAS complex. However, as in this example, we can achieve a narrow QAS complex. The better way uh, would be to do direct stimulation of the His bundle. If it is possible to stimulate the His bundle directly without exciting the surrounding myocardium, we speak of a selective his bundle stimulation. If the surrounding myocardium is stimulated together with the his bundle, we speak of a non selective his bundle stimulation. I did my first his bundle stimulation at the end of the last century. The X ray shows the position of the atrial electrode at the his electrode. In 2000, um, Deshmukh published results with the his bundle stimulation. He described feasibility of permanent his bundle pacing in 18 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, chronic and atrial fibrillation, and normal QAS uh, and a V node ablation. He was successful in 12 patients with a pacing threshold of 2.4 volts and an R amplitude of 1 to 3 to to uh, millivolts. The left ventricular ejection fraction improved from 20 to 30 percent, um, and he had two dislodgements. Long operation and fluoroscopic time and a success rate of only 50 to 60 percent prevented a breakthrough of this therapeutic method in these times. That changed with the development of spe special delivery sheets and electrodes. The first performed sheets came from Metronic together with a SYN electrode, the 3830, who is placed over the sheet without a guide wire. Now steerable sheets are available and all companies provide delivery sheets and his bundle leads. Let us start with the case report 
of a his bundle stimulation in a patient with a PR prolongation. A 65 years old male with recurrent dizziness, dyspnea in your class two, ejection fraction 64%, no cardiac, no coronary heart disease, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and sinus bradycardia with a uh, first degree AV block and a second degree AV block. The problem with this rhythm constellation is that the DD stimulation leads to permanent right ventricular stimulation and algorithm for reducing RV stimulation do not work here. In the first position, we have a nearly normal QAS complex, but the his bundle stimulation is not, not selective. Visible in the ECG by the small delta wave, you can see here, uh, that follows the stimulation artifact. In the second position, a little more cranial than the first, there's a selective his bundle stimulation with an isoelectric line between the stimulus artifact and the QAS complex. In an intra-individual comparison, Keen determined the hemodynamic effect of the three stimulation mode in patients with PR prolongation. His dual chamber pacing, pacing avoidance algorithm, and RV dual chamber pacing. As you can see, the best hemodynamic results are found in his DDD stimulation, while um, RV stimulation um, decreases the systolic, um, the systolic pressure compared to the avoidance algorithm. On the right side, you see the effect of an AV uh, delay optimization that is possible with his DDD pacing. When a prolonged AV delay, with a prolonged AV delay, you have a fusion of the A and the E wave in the mitral valve Doppler. By optimizing the AV time, the A and the E waves separate, bringing the A wave close to the ventricular contraction, in this way reducing diastolic mitral regurgitation and improving cardiac output. In patients with HEFREF and V node ablation, his bundle pacing normalized the ejection fraction over time, here more than three years. Um, whereas in patients with HEFPEF, there is a slight increase in ejection fraction and no decline as it is typical in RV pacing. In the case control study of, of Abdel Rahman, all patients required initial pacemaker implantation between 2013 and 2016 were included. Permanent his bundle pacing was attempted in consecutive patients in one hospital and uh, right ventricular pacing at a sister hospital. Implant characteristics, all cause mortality, heart failure hospitalization, and upgrades to biventricular pacing were tracked. Primary outcome was here the combined endpoint of death, heart failure, hospitalization, or upgrade to biventricular pacing. 765 patients were included with a mean ejection fraction of 55, uh, 54% and a mean follow-up of two years. There was a significant decline of the combined endpoint in all patients under the um, uh, his bundle uh, stimulation. The second study of VI Araman showed the long-term clinical outcomes in 192 uh, patients over five years. The um, ventricular pacing burden um, was 56%, and the combined endpoint of death um, and heart failure hospitalization was only significant in patients with a ventricular pacing rate of more than 40% here on the right side. Also, these studies probably contain overlapping collectives. Sun published a meta-analysis of these two studies 
Heart failure hospitalization was significantly reduced under his bundle pacing, while all cause mortality shows a favorable trend. The new guidelines rate the evidence of his bundle pacing and pacemaker indication only as a level C and given a 2B indication only in patients with an ejection fraction more than 40% who are anticipated to have, have more than 20% ventricular pacing. <laughs> Coming to um, his bundle pacing in left bundle branch block. Up a high uh, performed a detailed uh, intracardiac mapping of left septal conduction to assess the represents of level of complete conduction block in the hispokini system. A left intrahisian block was assessed in patients, um, uh, uh, it was found in 46% and a QRS correction by pacing was possible in these cases in 94%. In 16%, the block in 18%, the block was localized in the left bundle branch, of which 62% a QRS correction was feasible. Uh, in 36%, the block has a distal location without a possible possibility of QRS correction by pacing. So in two thirds of the patient with left bundle branch block, it is possible to have a stimulation over uh, uh, to correct the, the left bundle branch block with his stimulation. In the next case report, I show you a 56 years old uh, male in UR class three and a ejection fraction of 28%. He had a left bundle branch block with QRS wise of 172 milliseconds. The intracardiac electrogram over the pacing electrode, I show you here, uh, showed a his potential and the left bundle branch block. In the picture in the middle, you can see the stimulation side below the block. A stimulation from this point results in a short QAS complex, the 12 lead ECG in top gives you as a picture of selective his spindle stimulation with a QRS duration of 90 milliseconds and a pacing threshold of 0.75 volt. In another patient with his bundle uh, stimulation and correction of the left bundle branch block, you can see the same effect of resynchronization as we saw in the beginning video with, with biventricular pacing. In mapping studies, Arnold compared intrinsic unpaced QAS left bundle branch block with his bundle pacing and biventricular pacing. In left bundle branch block, we have the latest activation in the lateral wall of the left ventricle, that is the blue color. His bundle pacing shows the narrowest QAS complex with the most homogeneous uh, activation of the left ventricle. He is a green color. By biventricular pacing showed a right bundle branch morphology in VI and an inhomogeneous activation, the red and the green color. There is one prospective randomized study comparing his bundle stimulation with biventricular pacing in left bundle branch block, which is unfortunately limited in its scope and the high rate of crossover. Compared with biventricular CRT, the on-treatment analysis showed a higher reduction in QRS um, duration, a better rate of echocardiographic response and a greater change in left ventricular ejection fraction in his bundle CRT. In a long-term follow-up study, his bundle pacing showed a stable increase of ejection fraction over time. But this has a price in a high stimulation threshold 
over of average 2.3 volt over up and up to more than 3 volt. The new ECG guidelines therefore recommended in CRT candidates in whom coronal sinus lead implantation is unsuccessful, a class 2A indication for his bundle pacing. Beside his bundle pacing, a new procedure was developed, left bundle branch pacing. The site suitable for direct stimulation of the left bundle branch lies below, lies below the um, bifurcation. It can only be reached by penetration of the septum. Huang first described the effect of left bundle branch pacing. On the left, you see a left bundle branch block with a QS duration of 165 milliseconds. On the right side, a stimulated QS complex with a QS width of 104 milliseconds. A successful left bundle branch pacing result in a right bundle block configuration um, with a small QAS complex. In the middle, you see the his bundle pacing lead, which lies below the his bundle lead. Uh, uh, you see the um, left bundle branch pacing lead, which lies below the his bundle uh, pacing lead and uh, is penetrating the septum. The follow up over six and 12 months showed an increase in ejection fraction and, uh, uh, and a response rate of 75% in normalizing L function after 12 months. The same working group recently published a comparison between his bundle stimulation, left bundle branch pacing and biventricular pacing. The highest reduction in QRS duration was observed under his bundle pacing and left bundle branch pacing. His bundle pacing and uh, left bundle branch pacing showed higher ejection fraction improvement and a greater response rate than biventricular pacing. So let me conclude. To avoid pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy, do not stimulate from the right ventricular apex. That's a simple message. His spindle pacing could be an alternative for patients with PR prolongation, permanent atrial fibrillation, and a V-node ablation, and in patients with pacemaker indication and an expected high ventricular stimulation rate. In patients with heart failure and left bundle branch block, biventricular CRT have been demonstrated to relieve heart failure symptoms, reduce mortality, and improve clinical output. Conduction system pacing, um, like his bundle pacing and left bundle branch pacing, could be an alternative for patients with heart failure and ventricular dyssynchrony, especially when effective biventricular CRT is not achievable. But his Purkinje system pacing demonstrates demon promising results, but there are no, no uh, um, randomized controlled trials, no big uh, trials, and a short follow-up in most studies to support it for a first-line therapy. But we will see in the future that this recommendation will change. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bernd Lemke, for the excellent presentation. Uh, uh, for reason of time, I have a short question. A short question to you. Uh, in your opinion, uh, do you think um, in the future the cardiac synchronization therapy will be obsolete uh, when we have uh, optimized uh, the uh, his bundle pacing? I think it will not be obsolete. Um, from the studies, uh, electrophysiological studies, you see you can treat only maximal two thirds of the patient with left bundle branch block. Um, so um, the others uh, with a direct simulation. And um, if uh, the direct stimulation of the left uh, bundle uh, brings really 
an, um, an, a new aspect will show the future. We have no enough data to see it now that this will um, th that this will uh, overcome the CRT therapy with bioventricular pace. But I see in in this indication where today the CRT therapy has only only uh, a, a small uh, a, a very low uh, uh, evidence. There will be um, his bundle pacing um, in future. In the future, will have a, 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 a will come become a, a, a very uh, interesting indication. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for the reason of time, uh, now we are going to move to the structural heart disease, valve disease, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Florian Krutz from the Department of Cardiology in Clinic Starnberg. And he wants to give us an update in interventional mitral and tricuspid valve repair, an update in 2021. Florian, we are very excited. Distinguished um, speakers, um, dear Quang, dear Professor Wien, um, and colleagues in Vietnam, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to talk again now, nowadays or today from my home hospital. And uh, I will just start with um, sharing my monitor. And I hope that um, you can see um, what Präsentationsmodus noch einschalten unten rechts. Präsentationsmodus. Okay. Tiefer. Unten oh, rechts sorry. den Präsentationsmodus. Unten rechts den Präsentationsmodus. Ja, 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 ja. Irgendwas macht er jetzt nicht. Okay. Klar, Moment, ich bin sofort. I'll be in a minute. My computer is hanging. I don't know why it doesn't start the presentation. Um, do you see my monitor? Yes, we can see your monitor. We can see the first slide, but uh, not in uh, presentation mode. But in the yeah, normal, it doesn't start the presentation mode. Yes. You see what I'm clicking? <laughs> I don't know why that is taking place. In Can you English. move uh, to the next slide? Okay. Um, okay. We we see in my bildschirm, I believe, that is in. No, That's not what I Okay, can you see it now? Quang, can you see my monitor now? We, we see you and hear you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start my presentation. It works now. I'm sorry for the short Perfect. Um, PC trouble. Um, I'm going Perfect. to talk about interventional mitral and tricuspid valve repair update 2021. You all know that uh, in Germany, these two methods are very um, popular. Uh, especially the interventional mitral valve repair almost is kind of a, a routine technique in many hospitals as well as in ours. And the tricuspid valve repair is not that far yet. It's still um, a um, bailout technique, although data have been increasing 
about practicability and I will talk a little bit about that. Um, to start with, I will talk about the course of the um, mitral regurgitation. You all know this is an old slide from Enrique Serrano um, that depending on the uh, amount of EROR, the, or the, the, the amount of MR, um, the uh, mortality increases in uh, asymptomatic uh, MR and that doesn't distinguish between the uh, um, origin of the MR, whether it is a functional or a structural one. Uh, this is um, the reason why the European Society of Cardiology guidelines already in 2017 have uh, increased or um, in included the uh, repair of a um, relevant MR as a um, high recommendation and already uh, in this uh, guideline, the edge-to-edge um, uh, -edge repair using the mitral clip or nowadays also possible using the Pascal method, I'll come to that later, has been included whenever um, the, the, the surgical method is uh, not feasible. Now, the uh, systems that are used basically are the mitral clip and the Edwards um, system, which is called the Pascal device which um, has come out with some features that um, were improved in comparison to the first microclip, but the first microclip also has improved. And it has now four different shapes. The original shape, which uh, was called the NT shape, then a little bit wider shape, which is now called the NTW shape. And then there's a large clip, the XT and the XTW clip. And another feature that this clip now also has is what the uh, Pascal device already had for a long time that you can um, selectively um, use the so-called crippers which with, with uh, which you uh, grasp the leaflets. So um, leaflet grasping in some uh, tricking anatomies can be difficult and that was a feature that uh, was supposed to be um, improving the possibility of leaflet grasping. So one could uh, grasp one leaflet first and then uh, carefully move to the other leaflet and grasp it later. It's uh, not very much much used, but sometimes it can be of um, of advantage. Of course, there are other systems. There are for repairing transcatheter repair of the mitral valve. For example, the Carillion system, which is an indirect an annuloplasty uh, system, or the Cardioband uh, or the Mitral line. And these systems are um, selectively used in Germany in large valvular centers, whereas the mitra clip and the Pascal device, the edge-to-edge -edge repair has um, um, been um, spread to um, mid-sized clinics as well. So what is the study line for the large mitra clip studies? This, uh, the mitra clip is the only device that actually has large clinical trials which have um, brought up results. And in general, one will um, compare a functional MR, which is due to annulus dilatation or um, um, LV dysfunction and uh, general dilatation of the heart from a primary MR as seen here with this um, prolapse of the posterior leaflet. The primary MR um, and the secondary MR uh, in the initial, st initial study, uh, which was the mitra clip um, 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 Everest 2 trial, were um, initially not really um, differentiated before inclusion in the trial. However, the trial um, did differentiate where how many were functional and how many were um, and degenerative MR. So in this large trial, there was the first evidence that um, when using this mixed uh, population of uh, um, MRs, um, patients can actually um, profit in terms of freedom from um, worsening MR, um, mitral valve dysfunction or death in comparison to the surgical method. There was no improvement in, in mortality and there was no improvement in, um, in um, MR in comparison to the surgery. So it was more or less a 
equality uh, outcome that it can be equal to the surgical method. Uh, but I must say that the majority of patients in these studies were uh, um, degenerative MRs, which uh, whenever patients can be operated should be uh, um, corrected surgically. Now, the later coming studies, which I'll now present, the MyTriFR study and the COAP study, um, used a more uh, uh, realistic uh, patient uh, group, uh, which were mainly the functional MRs, which is the group that are very much treated today because the surgical data for these patients are not very good. Um, the second of these uh, published studies was the MITRE FR st um, study, and it has some uh, backdrops, especially uh, that the uh, operators who did the implantations were surgeons. They had only five training procedures before starting, and then they included the patients which were uh, NIHA class two to four, uh, had a low ejection fraction but did not have optimal medical treatment or even CRT uh, on a regular basis before, basis before they were included. Um, so basically functional patients um, were treated before the um, indication was really good because the optimal medical therapy and the CRT, which we today think is absolutely necessary if there's an indication for it, um, should have been corrected first. And, this study did not bring uh, uh, any result. There was no advantage in the control um, group, which um, in comparison to the intervention group. So from the uh, Mitra MFR study, there uh, have been brought about many questions whether the Mitra clip is of any use at all. Uh, another study, the, which was published just weeks before the Mitra FR study was the co trial. The co trial was very, very, in my opinion, very, very, well-designed trial. It was in 78 centers in US and Canada. It was only functional MR patients, which were also randomized to uh, optical medical, optimal medical treatment in comparison to um, um, the mitra clip. These patients had to have CRT before MR was assessed if CRT was indicated and they had to have optimal medical treatment. And then they were randomized, there was no crossover, and the experience of the implantators was uh, at least a, a mediocre experience. So it was centers that had used the mitra clip before in the majority. And in this study, there was a not nice benefit in terms of the primary endpoint, which was a combined endpoint of hospitalization and heart failure. And this was mainly due to um, fewer hospitalizations, but it was also uh, had a nice signal in terms of um, death from any cause. So it's necessary to compare the readout from those studies a bit. As I said, the Everest 2 trial uh, included um, um, different patients. Many of those were degenerative, some were functional, and it was a comparison of mitroclip versus surgery. Uh, in the mitra FR and the co trial, there were only functional patients. And the outcome, the main result was very different in terms that the mitra FR trial did not show any benefit, whereas the co trial did show less heart failure, rehospitalizations, and lower mortality with the mitra clip at 24 months. There were differences in study design. There was low uh, experience in the mitra FR trial and moderate experience in the a co apt trial and the some of the complications uh, which not were not even reported in the mitra fr trials and other complications like for example bleeding complications which i think uh, can be a big backdrop if the procedure is not done in a very controlled manner were high in the mitra fr trial and this is also in comparison to the large registers the trami and the excess eu uh, uh, register where many, many patients have been treated nowadays. And in these uh, registers, the operator experience is very high and the proce uh, procedural success rates are also very high. And then the complication rates are very much lower in comparison to the uh, randomized trials. 
So let's talk about a little bit about uh, patients that we use should select. There are challenging or even unsuitable anatomies, like for example, when the posterior leaflet is very short, so you can hardly grasp the device. Uh, this is due to, uh, um, especially at this uh, site where the MR is originating very short leaflet, these patients in many cases cannot be um, um, operated or intervened in a, in a perfect manner. There's patient uh, anatomies, for example, when there's mitral stenosis going along with the, um, with the insufficiency, the, the regurgitations where a edge-to-edge -edge method should be avoided. Uh, and there are very challenging anatomies, like, for example, this so-called Morbus Valo, which is basically a prolapse of every segment here accompanied with a little flail in the posterior leaflet, or uh, patients where there is a very eccentric um, gap, which needs to be uh, corrected here in the um, P2, P3, A3 uh, leaflet uh, portion. These patients may be corrected with a, an edge-to-edge -edge method, but it's much harder than a classical uh, functional MR where you want to grasp in the uh, A2, P2 region. And then there's the complications. I think it's very important and if you do such a controlled method to avoid complications. So we have to look at what the major complications are. These are bleeding complications and those are um, among the specific complications, it's the single leaflet uh, clip detachment complications. I must say that these data all were obtained with the uh, normal mitra clip, and now the uh, generation four mitra clip has many features that uh, allow us to avoid at least the single leaflet detachment complications. Let's look at how this uh, may end if you have single leaflet detachment. This may and in a rocking clip, which stands awkwardly and causes an enormous uh, new MR because the clip may rock against the posterior leaflet as shown here. And it can be in this case corrected if uh, by implantation of another clip. There are, uh, there's a very, um, um, Awkward complication, which we've experienced sometimes, and I would like to show it. There are patients which have um, pulmonary hypertension independent of um, MR. If you implant the clip in these patients, we have sometimes seen a sudden drop in oxygen saturation upon um, removal of the implantation sheets due to a right to left chunt. And in these patients, it may even be necessary to acutely close the, um, the iatrogenic ASD as has done here. And this will result in an immediate uh, return to good oxygenization. So this is something um, one can observe. And these are just some examples uh, to make sure what you need to keep in mind if you want to um, start an, a mitral clip repair pro um, program. Now let's summarize the interventional MR repair. It is a the MR is a heterogeneous condition with several etiologies and anatomic variation. The echo is the most important feature to assess if the MR is primary or due to LV dysfunction and annulus dilation. Uh, the edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair mimics surgery by creating a double orifice valve, as you all know. Uh, there are other methods as the annuloplasty devices, which may address the problem. In some situations may even be um, um, uh, methods which can be used in combination uh, in very dilated annually. The experience, the imaging and device improvements all allow for um, improving results of M MV edge to edge repair over the years. So not that of today, I would like to say that in the right patient uh, edge to edge mitral regurgitation repair is a very safe and effective method um, in the hands of an experienced operator using the novel devices. Uh, these are the MitroClip G4 Generation 4 system and the Pascal system uh, because they allow us to overcome some of the concurrent anatomical limitations of edge to edge repair. And uh, for all the other systems, the clinical outcome data are limited. And they, uh, at least to my knowledge, and they are 
uh, most often uh, used in uh, in situations where the edge to edge method uh, is not feasible and surgery is not an option. Now let's talk about the tricuspid valve. It has been called the forgotten valve because um, there has never been a real good um, method to correct it, neither surgery um, nor medications. And we all know from our experience that the etiology of a tricuspid regurgitation is most often due secondary to other uh, heart or valvular diseases and also does not have a very typical symptom um, um, combination. Now, often it is due to increased pulmonary artery pressure due to left heart disease or PI, PA hypertension. And this has to be distinguished from an, a primary tricuspid uh, regurgitation due to um, uh, de deceased um, valvular apparatus or to a dilation of the right heart chambers which then can be called the functional or even the primary tricuspid regurgitation. Now we know uh, from operated patients, these are patients uh, which had been sur uh, surgically corrected in, a, uh, in the mitral valve and uh, it was um, during the post-operative course um, observed uh, what the influence of the remaining TR would be on uh, the probability of survival and we know that the severity of TR is a major factor in survival in these patients. Now, the pathophysiology, physiology, as I said, is due to RA or RV volume overload, tricuspid ring dilation, and this all may lead to a worsening of TR, TR go along with atrial fibrillation and RV pump failure. As I said, the symptoms are not quite as obvious as with uh, uh, MR, where you have a symptom of basically um, cardiac failure or cardiac congestion. In TR, it is more a combination of um, uh, worsening of general condition, often very, very sick patient with generalized edema, ascites, um, con con liver congestion, rise in hepatic enzymes or even cirrhosis cardiac. You can see the jugular vein pulse and they are sleepy and very sick. Now, from the um, first years of, um, of effort to um, improve um, the TR by um, non-invasive or, or minimally invasive methods, um, the societies have come up with a more distinct grading of the severity of uh, TR. We now say there are five grades of TR and they can be um, um, lined with five stages, five clinical stages. And we have learned that the most uh, impressive, the torrential uh, um, TR may not be something that can be corrected very well. Even the massive TR often cannot be corrected very well by an edge to edge method. When we come back to the uh, surgical guidelines, it's quite clear that the primary TR should be operated on if the patient is surgically uh, or feasible for a surgical uh, procedure. Whereas the secondary uh, TR uh, has a recommendation for um, being um, um, reconstructed when the patient is going undergoing left-sided surgery uh, in any way, but not when there is pulmonary hypertension or only a moderate TR. And these recommendations may differ from the uh, future of tricuspid repair uh, by an edge-to-edge -edge methods. Now, there are many um, different interventional repair methods. Of course, there are the surgical methods. Then there is uh, a large number of uh, procedures for the direct ring annuloplasty. And there are the edge-to-edge uh, -edge methods using the First, the mitral clip. Now, uh, Abbott has come up with the tree clip, or even the Pascal device. There has been, uh, or there is still been used the, the so-called former method, where the, a spacer is introduced in order to reduce regurgitation orifice. And of course, there is interventional or uh, mini procedures, mini surgical procedures, where, where there are um, um, direct valve repla replacements, either. Um, 
um, by cardiologist alone or in a hybrid procedure. I will today only talk about the triclip device. It's um, similar to the mitroclip device, but has uh, um, been designed specifically for the um, different anatomy coming to the tricus clip valve because you don't need to uh, do a LA, uh, um, um, left atrial septum puncture and you have different angles at the top of the clip. But the steering is quite similarly, similar and the device uh, setup is also similar to the mitral clip device. Now, these are uh, nice images from a presentation by um, Jörg Hausleitner which show a, a transgastric view of the TR by TOE. And we can see that the three leaflets may all differently be affected by the TR. And there has been a lot of discussion what the strategy for the repair should be. Um, the um, most patients which are treated nowadays are been treated by a strategy as outlined in this paper by your Hausleitner today, where either the anterior and septal um, leaflet or the posterior and septal leaflet are being um, uh, grasped, and the aim is a bicuspidalization of the tricuspid valve. This has been evaluated in the Triluminate study. It's a single arm study without a comparison group, a feasibility study, uh, which has been published this year in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And, uh, it has shown that in the hands of these experienced operators, um, the major advance, adverse events in those very sick patients uh, are um, acceptable. 85 patients have been included and the one um, year outcome in terms of the reduction of hospitalizations compared to the year before the patients were treated is promising. Also, the procedural result is promising as the durability of the repair seems to be uh, stable in at least a, uh, a um, relevant group of patients. But also from the study, we can see uh, that this is a much more complex procedure than the uh, mitral, mitral valve edge to edge repair due to the different anatomy of the right ventricle, uh, to the different anatomy of the tricuspid valve, and also due to the uh, different pathophysiology underlying the, um, the uh, tricuspid regurgitation. We know from another study of also um, being initiated or participated here in Munich, um, which uh, um, um, compared whether it is of um, um, advantage to do an interventional concomitant MRTR repair by the mitroclip in this case. And we know from the study that those patients who had severe regurgitation profited if it was concomitantly uh, corrected with the uh, severe MR. But altogether, there are no um, randomized large clinical studies. And so um, tricuspid regurgitation repair by the edge to edge method still remains a a bailout experimental procedure in patient where up to optimal medical treatment um, does not lead to a relevant improvement of symptoms. We know a bit about the, the ideal patient for this method. It should not be a too heavy MR, a TR, be, um, the pulmonary artery pressure should not be too high uh, it is not of any favor if the uh, TR is induced by pacemaker leads uh, and is, if the uh, coabdation defect is not too large, it is easier to grasp and to correct the TR. So altogether, it must be said that with tricuspid valve repair doing a, using a transcatheter method, most patients um, they suffer from end-stage heart failure and it's a um, bailout procedure for those patients with severe comorbidities which are not eligible for any surgical method. Um, the clinical best benefit is still unclear, but there is uh, evidence from the Triluminate study that there may be an improvement in systems, but it has only be symptoms, but it is only be a single arm study without comparison. 
The outcomes uh, are hard to assess. The echocardiographic features or the improvement is a bit easier to assess. There will be uh, a clear path to the patient selection. It's the key to the procedure. And uh, we are awkwardly waiting for more data for um, um, randomized studies, which include patients which were treated by the method in comparison to um, optimal medical treatment or even surgery. Thank you for your attention.